Well, we invite you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 16. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. By loving kindness and truth, iniquity is atoned for. And by the fear of the Lord, one keeps away from evil. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Better is a little with righteousness than great income with injustice. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. As we mentioned this morning, and as we mentioned the Sunday before that, it seems almost natural that we, at the first part of the new year, give some thought to what has taken place over the past year, maybe the years, the things that were accomplished, the things that were not accomplished, the things that are still in process. And we look to the coming year to see how we're going to live our lives. And notice that we always want to at least live with some sense of accomplishment and success, do we not? When was the last time that you met somebody who was making plans for the new year and they were saying, well, this is how I will uh, really batter myself around here and over here is where I'll really take a whipping and over here is where I'm going to bring on my own death. Now, if you came across a person like that, I am sure that one of the first things you'd want to do is get a hold of a counselor because this person is in desperate need. So I think, at least for the healthy mind, it's a fair assumption that we look to the future with some sense and anticipation of success. But what I would like to at least present this evening is that this text, as well as others in the God's Word, teaches us that our desired success and satisfaction in life really do not hinge upon the circumstances of life. And that's the one thing that we need to remember over and over again. The circumstances of life can indeed be primary players, but in the end, they are secondary. They depend upon a right relationship with the Lord. And that relationship is going to center around the difference in capability between God and man and the commitment of God to man. Look at that opening verse again before we get going. Better allow me to get into the right chapter. The plans of the, of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Notice God and man are set side by side. And when we look closely, there are points of comparison, and there is at least one grand point of contrast. And that contrast is all important. So let's take a look then at the difference in the capability between God and man all the ways of a man are clean in his own sight. But the Lord weighs the motives. Now we speak of man's capacities. We speak of man's capabilities. And notice there is some sense of self-assessment. -assess as he takes a look at his lifestyle, as he takes a look at his plans, Notice these ways, these paths that he will follow, 
are considered to be clean and right by him. So what we see here is humankind as the thinking one. The humankind as the one who can look at his life and say that there is value to it. And this is what I will do to sustain that value, to increase that value. So he is thinking, planning. And notice that in this particular verse, he is always thinking and planning, and he has the moral and the ethical in view. And we'll come back to that. But notice when it comes to the implementation and the execution of his plans. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. For now, we just want to use this verse to emphasize man's capability. That indeed he can think in the abstract, he can think of the future, he can plan for tomorrow, and this he's capable of doing. And notice that his plans will reveal his values. The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. And the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. And there are at least two things here. We go back to that first verse that we read, all the ways of man are clean. He will always consider himself to be moral, or at least not as bad as the other guy. I think I shared this story with you. I've never really forgotten it when I was teaching a philosophy course during the summertime at the college. And we were in the section on the philosophy of religion and the existence of evil. And of course, a lot of the students basically said, there's no such thing as evil. But once I said, there is a God, what do you say to that? Then they say, if there is a God, then how come he permits evil? And I would basically say, you can't have it both ways. If there is no God and there is no evil, how is it that evil shows up when God comes into the picture? And so I'd go through a process and say, all right now. The one thing that we seem to hold in common in the discussion is evil. And you are holding God responsible and you're keeping silent to yourself. So we will say that evil does exist. And then I draw a line through God, but God does not exist. Who then is responsible for evil if evil has to do with morality and morality has to do with mankind? This one student said, are you calling me evil? I said, no, it seems to me like the process we followed made the conclusion. And he says, well, I'm not, as e I'm not as evil as other people I know. And I said, then you've just fairly well confessed to the fact that you're evil. It's just that you're not as bad as the other guys that you know. You know, he never came back to class after that, and I never understood why. <laughs> but I didn't feel too real bad because that was one less paper that I had to grade. But notice that many is the time that out of the darkness of an evil heart, evil actions will come. But there is regularly a mindset that says, my ways are clean. His plans reveal his values because the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. We act consistently with ourselves. Good people may do bad things, but good people will consistently do good things. And I'm speaking of goodness now in the sense of being born again. And when they do bad things, they know them to be bad and they will confess them. Bad people may do good things, but consistently they will not. And oftentimes the things that we consider to be good have evil motives and intents. 
So fundamentally, the good man will act consistently with his goodness, and the evil man will act consistently with his evil. And out of the mouth speaks that which fills his heart. And this is the one thing that we can never get around, that we will always act consistently. We will never act contrary to our nature. If our nature is that of unbelief, we will act in a manner that reflects that unbelief. If we are born again, we will act in the fashion of those who are born again. And notice that man does not have the power, though, for perpetual implementation. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Notice that God is the one who permits the activity that goes beyond the plan. You can make plans, I can make plans. I can look back over my life and find some plans that are still in the planning stage. And they would be in the planning stage, but they're somewhere on the back burner. And so we see it quite clearly that the plans of the heart belong to mankind. What we plan is ours. What we have created and how we have created it, it's ours. What we have intended is ours. But notice the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. If the implementation of the plan is verbal, God will say yes or no. If the implementation of the plan verbally begins to express what is going to take place in, con in conduct, God will step in to say yes or no. And the mind of, of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We are looking at sovereignty. We are looking at the sovereignty of mankind and the extent of his sovereignty. The extent of his sovereignty exists only in his mind. After that, that sovereignty must submit to the sovereignty of God. And God is the one who permits the expression of the plans, and God is the one who permits or orders the steps of implementation. Now, it seems like it seems to bother some people, some Christian people, and let me put the question to you this way. Would you rather have a God who is like this or a God who can be thwarted by your plans? <laughs> the choice is yours. Notice God's infinite capability. Man's definitely capabilities are limited. The Lord has made everything for its own purpose even the wicked for the day of evil. Notice that God's capability is infinite. And notice that in his planning and in his thinking, everything has its own purpose. Even Aristotle said everything has its own purpose. I think in one of the things that I read, right down to the stones that are on the ground. And wherever there is a purpose, there is one who has spoken and acted with purpose and intentionality. He has made everything for his own purpose, and even the wicked for the day of evil. By the time history has run its course, we will see a sovereign God who has acted justly and righteously and who has acted graciously and lovingly. And often is the time, and rightly so, that we praise God for the goodness that he pours out upon our lives and upon the lives of those who are significant to us. And we see the goodness of his grace. But the day will come when we will be standing in a position where we will see the grandeur of God's sovereignty and that grandeur will reflect his majesty. 
the majesty of his righteousness, the majesty of his judgment, the majesty of his love, his grace, his long suffering. And this is not an idea that's just new to the 21st century, or is it just new to me? St. Anselm, so long ago, says, Goodness is the overriding attribute of God because everything he does is good. If he exercises judgment on Assyria in the Old Testament, that judgment is just and therefore it is good, and if it is good, it demonstrates his goodness. And we need from time to time to give some thought to the greatness and the grandeur of our God. And he is the one who is comprehensive in his plan and in his sovereignty and in his authority, he also has the power to bring these things to pass. And we keep in mind that he is the one who cares for us. In meeting our needs, he is infinite in his capability. All the ways of a man are clean in his own sight, but the Lord weighs the motives. Somewhere I put this where it doesn't belong or else I jumped over one. Have I been out of sync with my verses, you guys? Okay, well then I put this one in and it's out of place. But at any rate, I think what I wanted to point out here is that God will also oversee our plans. And the idea comes even in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 where we remain faithful to him and all things will be revealed on that day even the motives and the intentions of our hearts. Even our motives and our intentions have moral and ethical value. And this is who he is and what he does. And he weighs the motives. Now I'm with it. He meets our needs by revealing our motives. And we should thank God that he reveals our motives even before that day. And this is his goodness and the outpouring of his grace upon us day by day. And he will correct our values and our intentions. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. Aren't you glad after it's over with that God has stepped in and basically convicted you of some things that are not right, of some things that are wrong, and that in the convicting work of his Holy Spirit, he's called us to change? Is that not the beginning of salvation? If it weren't for the goodness of his convicting power, we would still be as pagan as pagan can be. And he corrects our values and our intentions. This is much the idea that our Lord gives in, in his opening message in the Sermon on the Mount when he says to seek first the kingdom of heaven and all of these other things will be added unto you. Notice that he is concerned about the affairs of our lives day by day but he is also concerned with the welfare of the inner man, the soul. And he is telling us that our priorities should match his. And his priority is the kingdom of God. And we are called to be men and women of the kingdom. We are called to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. We are called to say the kingdom is coming, be ready. The king is coming, be ready. And when we heed that call, we make the change by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. He corrects our values and our intentions, and he knows our hearts. Sometimes he knows our hearts better than we do, and we are glad for that. And it is out of a matter of love and support. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his rep reproof. For whom the Lord loves, 
he reproves, even as the father corrects the son in whom he delights. I remember long ago, one time, I don't know what was going on, I have oftentimes thought that my dad knew what I was planning on doing before I ever got around to doing it. But there was something going on in the neighborhood, and Dad said, you know, what, the, what is going on here is wrong, and if I ever catch you doing it, you're going to get the belt. And I don't want you to cry and complain because the next-door neighbor's boy doesn't get the belt. He's not my son. You are. And you better be glad that I'm going to give you the belt because if I let this go and you end up in jail, they don't care as much about you as I do. I got the message. Of course, you know, this was back in the dark ages when our beautiful little personalities were being warped because we got the belt. <laughs> but notice that the Lord does this out of love. Whom he loves, he reproves. It is his desire, it is his intent that we will be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And he will change us and he will reprove us, and he will discipline us until we conform. And notice that by supporting the plans and intentions of our hearts, he does that as well. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. It's always interesting to ask, when you first read that, what is your first response? When you say, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Is your first response is, God is going to say no, or God is going to say yes? What is your first response on that? Yeah, somebody said no. That, I'm with you. About the first time I read this and was thinking it through, I thought, what do you know? He's going to say no to me. And what do you know? He has plenty of times. And what do you know? I'm grateful. But it also means that he will say yes. Notice that the whole thing, as we have studied it so far, is contingent upon the moral and ethical value of our intents and our purposes in keeping with the mind and the will of God. And he will support the plans and the intentions of our hearts. And sometimes he will get us to point B from point A, but he doesn't get us there the way we planned it. Sometimes we can sit down and say, this is what I'm going to do. Here I am at point A, I'm going to go to point B, and this is how I'm going to get there. And all of a sudden you find out that you're not getting there that way. And then you find out that you're there. And then you find out that God is saying, Yes, I am supporting you to go from A to B, but it's going to be my way. If for no other reason that we should know that he is caring for us. And he will support the plans of our hearts. And this is the difference in the capability between God and man. Both sentient beings. One without beginning, one without end. One infinite and the other with the beginning and certainly with a purposeful ending. But notice that his capabilities to accomplish those plans rest in the hand of God. And everything in this creation has a purpose. And this then leads us to the commitment of God to us, even though we've touched on it. He who gives attention in the word will find good and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Notice the commitment of God to making our lives really worth something and to be satisfying. He blesses those who submit to the word. He blesses those who submit to the will of the Lord. He blesses those who trust in him. And blessing is the conferral of those items of those attributes that bring about the sense of well-being and happiness. And he is committed to making our lives satisfying. Not always easy. I don't know very many people whose lives are so good that it's hard to tell the difference between heaven and earth. But he makes the life worth living to those who will submit his word. 
I came across a set of statistics a few weeks back on Bible reading in the United States. And there is a small percentage of people, including evangelicals, who read the Bible regularly. And do you know what regularly meant? Four times a week. But it, I didn't, didn't, didn't say anything about how much time. But I thought four days a week, well, I guess that's over half of the week, but I'm wondering what kind of study there can be. You know, if it's just one of these little daily devotionals where you read a verse and you say a prayer and you get on your way, I suppose it's better than nothing, but I don't know that it rises to the standard of this passage that we're looking at here. He gives attention to the word. This is the one who will find good. And he is blessed who trusts in the Lord. Notice that understanding the word is important. As James puts it, we must be those who know the word, but the ones who are blessed are the ones who are the doers of the word. You cannot be a doer of the word if you don't know it, but you can know it and not be a doer. And this is what the passage is pointing out here. We have to know the word. And another one of the statistics, one of the concluding remarks basically was that the evangelical church in the United States is more deistic than theistic. Deistic meaning that there are those who say that there is a God. The God of design, the God of the universe, but not necessarily the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not necessarily the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And there are more believers who would be very much at home with some of the founding fathers who themselves were deists. And we need then to know the word, to know the author of the word, and to respond to the word because it is God's mandate for you and for me. And he blesses those who trust in him. It's one thing to do it. It's another thing to do it out of trust and faith. And notice that in this sense, he goes before us to pave the way. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. I'm sure that there are qualifications as we would pick up this theme and run with it through the remainder of the Bible. But at the end, the promise of peace is still there. And he goes before us. Now, which is the God that you want? If you had your choice. Are you going to have the God who cannot intervene at the point of the tongue? Who cannot intervene at the point of the deed? Or do you want a God whose concern would be such that our plans, if they were uttered, would be personally devastating, and he will step in and say no. A God who knows our plans and the motives and the intentions of our heart, and he sees that this is ridden with disaster, and he steps in and says no. Or one who basically knows the, mo the intents and the motives of the heart and says, you've made the decision, go for it. Oh, did you go over the cliff? How sad. It seems to me then that we get back to one of these scripture verses that we probably all memorized as children. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. It isn't as though that we have our workshop over here where we put our plans together, but when we commit it to the Lord, the notion of committing our plans to the Lord means that we want to commit them in a way that it reflects his will. It's important that we face the truthfulness of our inadequacies. It's important to acknowledge that God is totally adequate and by accepting these two propositions as true, 
it's imperative that we commit our plans to him. As we've touched on a couple of weeks ago in James, it's nothing but arrogance, it's nothing but hubris to say, come, today or tomorrow, let's go to such and such a place and we will stay a year and we will do business and we will make a profit. That's conceit, James tells us. What should be said is, if the Lord wills. And that is not just a token statement, but it is the expression of belief and trust. And it's impossible to successfully commit our plans to him without committing our lives to him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. The paths will be there, but will they be straight or will they be crooked? Will he be in our lives or will he not? Oftentimes, it's one thing to say, I believe that there is a God, to borrow it a little bit from the Lord himself. The demons believe and tremble so just saying that there is a God is not enough. What is sufficient is to say there is a God and he is great and he is good. He is good in his righteousness and in his justice. He is good in his compassion and his grace. And for that reason, I entrust my life to his care to, my, to take care of me. And so as we look at another year, let's remember this verse that we have probably known since childhood. To memorize it is easy enough. Sometimes the doing of the trust is the difficult thing, isn't it? But we have no real choice. We must trust in the Lord with all of our heart, meaning without any reservation, deep inside. And wise is the person who does not lean on his own understanding. And wise is the person who acknowledges the Lord in every aspect of our lives. And he will make our paths straight. This is what we have before us. We have before us a number of days and we don't know how many. We have before us a number of days and events that will happen that we will have control over. We don't know what they are. Other things that we will have no control over. But we know who is in control of the whole thing. And we know that his control is an exercise of practical love and care for his people. May we find strength in that in the days that are dark and gloomy May we rejoice in that in the days that are bright. And let us give thanks that all of this is by grace and grace alone. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for the fact that you will step in and order our steps, that we can indeed make our plans, and so we should. But these plans should be submitted to your will. And may we be able to do this ever and always. Thank you for the time that we could have together this night to enjoy each other's company, to fellowship around the word. And we ask that you will cause us to have a clearer understanding of your word, to be reminded of things that we once knew, and to perhaps gain some new insights as well. And may all these things be a further encouragement to strengthen our trust and our faith in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.